you. What an incredibly inspiring morning. How, how many had coffee in the break? Okay. Yay. I, uh, I'm so excited to be here today. I'm going to talk about a bit more on the design side of things and the pixels. I'm going to focus on how to present ideas so that your client will listen. And sort of the underlying thesis that I want you to at least consider today is that uh, we're too focused on trying to prove why our idea is the right idea when we pitch design. And we're not trying to prove, uh, we are trying to prove ourselves right, which ironically is a terrible way of being right in the end. So uh, we're very afraid of failure. When we walk in into a meeting, we're so afraid of going in there and becoming rejected and walking out there feeling like a failure. And we know that failure is inevitable, but yet when it comes, we're often very unprepared to deal with that situation when it arises. So I think, therefore, we sort of <laughs> strive to, to never fail. And a good way of, of striving to not fail is to just assume that we're right. So we spend a lot of time assuming that we are correct when we pitch design. So what I want you to consider at the end of this talk is that um, if you want your client to listen, talk about why you will fail in your pursuit of designing something valuable for them, talk about why they will fail, and talk about risk. And I divided this talk into sort of three uh, main topics. One, risky business, uh, trying to set the context with some experience from Spotify. And then strong beliefs lead to poor decisions. And then third, some practical tips on how you can include risk and uh, failure in your own work. Uh, before that, though, quickly, hello, hi, yes, this is me, Tobias is my name. I come from a town where it always rains on the west coast of Sweden, around here, where everyone is called Glenn, <laughs> for some reason. And I, as Oliver mentioned, I, I worked for these companies. So I was very lucky to arrive at Spotify when we were only two designers. And I was responsible for the UI design of, of our apps as we grew as a company. And then I uh, was in GitHub, was at GitHub for a while in San Francisco, doing both development and design. And now I was leading the design for Minecraft. So a lot of the advice and, and context that I'm sort of talking about is based in like medium-sized companies. So just be aware of that my bias there, that's sort of my truth that I'm speaking from. So one, risky business. If you have a laptop in your, uh, you right now, I'm terribly sorry because then I'm gonna ask you all to stand up for a second. So we are gonna do a coin flipping tournament. It's very fun, I promise. Uh, here are the rules. If you get heads, you keep standing. And if you get tails, you sit. And we always flip at the same time. So I'm going to count to three, and then we all flip. And then if you get tails, you sit. And if you get heads, you keep standing. If you don't have a coin, this is much easier also, even if you do have a coin, you can Google flip a coin. <laughs> and you get an interactive JavaScript thingy where you can flip a coin. So I highly recommend Google. It's also uh, less or more accurate, I guess, than if you're trying to cheat. So, everyone, sorry, a lot of users, please stand up. Thank you for participating. Right, so on the count of three, we all flip. And then if you, if you get tails, you're out. Like, you're not going to stand again and keep flipping, okay? So, uh, one, two, three, flip. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, there's one, and one, two, three, flip. Nice. Okay, one, two, three, flip. One, two, three, flip. <laughs> One, two, three, flip. We all use I think <laughs> we're in the same seed. Uh, okay, one, two, three, flip. One, 
Great. Oh, everyone. No. Okay. Okay, everyone who's still standing, please come up on stage. Well, let's do the final. <laughs> Your face of total disappointment. I'm very sorry. Okay. Give all these guys a big round of applause. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's do it again. One, two, three. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I can't be Google. Oh, you can't be Google. Yes. <laughs> okay. One, two, three, flip. <laughs> sales, 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 sales. Is everyone says, okay, okay, stand, stand. we gotta have a winner. Okay, one, two, three, flip. Heads. Tails. We got a winner. Uh, what? Work on. Okay. Uh, what's your name? Bernardo. Bernardo, great job. So, um, wha what's your mindset when you're flipping a coin? Uh, being a professional coin flipper is like that's what I do for my living. So, <laughs> I wake up in the morning and say heads or tails, and whatever the coin decides, it's gonna be my mood. <laughs> that's beautiful. Well, how? Uh... <laughs> and so, when did you start flipping? Uh, about when I was eight, <laughs> yeah, kind of like hit me in the head, one coin fell, so I decided, yeah, whatever. <laughs> like from the gods? Yes, indeed. <laughs> so, do you, do you remember your first flip? It was tails. <laughs> <laughs> you improved now, I see, yeah, okay. So, do you have any tips for anyone else who wanted to become a professional coin <laughs> Uh You have to, to have faith. You have to believe. That's it. That, that's pro tip. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so that's an incredibly long way of saying that as soon as we have that was by the way it's, I think eight or seven heads heads that was impressive. So uh, of saying like as soon as we got a competitive system we got a lot of pe people competing. Uh, we're going to sing out some, and eventually we're going to have one winner. So any competitive system sort of produces at least one winner. And XKCD has a beautiful comic on this topic, uh, where he says, never stop buying... This is a guy on stage with a lot of money, right? So maybe all of us here on stage today. Uh, never stop buying a lot of tickets, no matter what anyone tells you. I failed again and again, but I never gave up. I took extra jobs and I poured the money into tickets and here I am, proof that if you put in the time, it pays off. Have faith, as Bernardo would have said. Um, every inspirational speech by someone successful should have to start with a disclaimer about survivorship bias. Right? And I think the problem is often that we assume that the person who won knows why they won. And we have this tendency of just describing the winners as the explanation for why they won. So when we see the Mona Lisa, we might not necessarily know why it's the most, one of the most famous paintings on earth. So people who try to explain why it is so just name some random attributes from that painting. Like, it's a beautiful smile. And if that was true, then everyone would try to paint really beautiful smiles, right? That's probably not the reason, it just correlates with it. So the winner might not know why they won. Here's Spotify um, and all the other comp competing streaming services and the number of paid subscribers over a month. So here's a clear winner. Spotify, this is a year ago. Spotify is actually bigger than all of the competitors combined. Here's uh, a year later when they released some new numbers, up to 50 million um, paying subscribers. Apple is actually trailing now. They had a boost, it seems like, when they pushed it as the default music service on their platform. These are just some of the competitors row. Here are some other streaming services. Here are the ones that failed. So I think it's pretty amazing that Spotify won. I mean, they're going up against competitors like Apple, Microsoft, Google, the companies that build computers, phones, and like the structure of the internet. They got more money than some old companies, and they're not really afraid of like bulldozing over other companies. We've seen them do that before. 
and they could probably conquer whatever they set out to conquer, at least that's what it feels like. Yet this small company from Sweden, a country of farms, built the bookshelf, meatballs, and put very specific rules for how you should queue, that invented the smorgasbord, which is basically leaving food on a table. A couple of nerds from that country um, still came out ahead. So, how did they get there, is sort of the question. And the answer is not, we made the logo smaller and introduced more white space. That's, I hope, or I think what any designer would hope to really say, uh, but uh, that's not it. And the idea isn't unique, right? Everyone here in that competing list are sort of applying the best design practices. They're doing the same concept. And there are millions of things that Spotify could do, but few of them will produce success. So here are some true things that I think in our industry right now, we, we tend to want to apply to any given product within design. Um, this is sort of regarded as generally true, I think. Cleaner is better, sort of true. Flat is better. Um, more white space is better. Uh, React is better, if you're a developer. <laughs> And then no hamburger menu is better. It used to be the opposite if you, for a year or so. Now we're all moving off hamburgers. And this, I'm not, I'm, I'm using these myself. I think they are valuable, but sometimes we describe a project as like having good design because they subscribe to these sort of mantras, but that doesn't really mean anything. It's just an arbitrary description that correlates with sort of the, the current trends, right? So the question is, of course, better in which way, for how many, to what extent, at what cost, and in which context, for which sort of app, is this actually a good pattern? So spending six months on a redesign might produce nothing of measurable value, and I think we should tell our clients so when we pitch an idea. So uh, we usually think we have succeeded because we did X, and that's really easy for me to say, um, being a Spotify, and just take something arbitrary, but I do not think um, I think we think that in too many cases, but we should really be thinking we might have succeeded despite doing all of that stuff. Um, and we're still trying to figure out exactly why we won. So we try to say invest in uh, X, that's going to be great. Uh, you're going to get outcome Y. But in sort of pushing those two concepts to a client, we forget uh, to think about probability, which is basically risk, right? What's the risk of failure. We should always include the probability of something succeeding and the impact. So when we're too focused on why something is the best idea, we forget to assess impact and risk. And our clients always think about risk. That's like what a business owner does very well. Um, and I think design is, is the business of trying to predict success, so, so we should think in those terms. Here's an old design of Spotify before they moved off the hamburger menu. So this was trendy for a while, and therefore, hamburger menu. They actually had a tie bar before this. But now here is, I think two years ago, hamburger menu, you push it, you get all these um, menu options. They moved to this with a, a tie bar at the, top, uh, at the bottom. And this did move a lot of significant and important metrics for Spotify. But they took so many tests to make sure that that was actually the case. And they were hesitant to move in this direction because they did not know the probability of it succeeding and it's a massive project, right? So I think every design, is, design proposal is an implicit prediction even if you're not pitching it in that way. And Spotify are good at innovating, which means they're good at managing risk. So unless we talk about risk, I, our clients will, when we, I think, leave the room, possibly behind our backs. And uh, which leads me to um, sort of the second part of this talk, which is strong beliefs lead to poor decisions. So this is a guy with some strong beliefs. This is Steve Ballmer, uh, former CEO of Microsoft. He famously said, there's no chance that the iPhone is going to get any significant market share. No chance. It's a $500 subsidized item. He said this in 2007. So, like hindsight is 2020, sure. But how, just a quick vote of hands. 
Like, what do you think about that statement? Totally off, do like thumbs down. And if he was somewhat right, do thumbs in the middle. And then he was, he was pretty accurate, do thumbs up. I know it's a stupid vote, but please just, yeah, okay. Right, he's pretty much way out there. So um, here's the full quote. It's sort of a funny question. Um, would I trade 96 of the market for 4% of the market? Laughter. I want to have products that appeal to everybody. Now we'll get a chance to go through this again in phones and music players. Here's the original quote. There's no chance that the phone is going to get any significant market share. They may make a lot of money, but if you actually take a look at the 1.3 billion phones that get sold, I prefer to have our software in 90, 60 or 70 or 80 percent of them than I would have two or three. So now this is the time when they were, um, I think they were about to buy Nokia or they had bought them. But it's, it's that sort of time when Nokia was still a big player, right? So this is an interesting thing. If we look at uh, the numbers here, this is a few years afterwards, we see Apple at 20%. Android in a massive lead. And this is the interesting part. He says they may make a lot of money. That is exactly Apple's strategy. They're not trying to capture market share. So when he says they're not going to get any significant market share, and then he follows it up with this, I think he's like sort of on point. He's sort of right. So, so given some more information, what do you think? Was he totally off, somewhat right, or pretty accurate? All right, okay, still, yeah, maybe, maybe going upwards. So let's do this one more time. But if you actually take a look at the 1.3 billion phones, that's not the smartphone market. That's the entire phone market at that point, which we tend to forget existed. Um, so he was around here when he said that, 1.3 billion phones. He's talking about these two markets combined. All right, so we've got feature phones, which is Nokia land, and we've got smartphones, which is general smartphone land. I don't know. Uh, okay, so then we see basically iOS share was 20% of smartphones. Smartphone was one third of phone sales. And then divided that by three, we get around 6.7% of market share for Apple. So his, his prediction at the top of the quote is 4% in 2012. Apple had 6.7 around so, and then if we back, uh, back up a year, it's 5.8. <sighs> so was he totally off or, or is he right or pretty accurate? I think he's pretty much spot on with his quote, yet he failed with implementing a strategy to counter that. But I think with his quote, we judge him very quickly. So this is the point. John F. Kennedy said, for the great enemy of truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived, and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. Too often we hold fast to the cliches of our forebears. We subject all facts to a prefabricated set of interpretations. We enjoy the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. This is why it's important to try to prove that you are wrong when you pitch something. So I think players like this man entering the field makes truth look very simple because he's so obviously wrong and obviously lying that truth looks very simple. We hear what he says and we're like, no, he's wrong and I'm right. And that's probably true, but it's not a good way to make a good judgment. So the question is really, is there a proven way scientifically um, that produces better decisions? This is a leading question. I, I would not be standing here if it was no. There's a very good study by Philip Tetlock um, called the Political Forecasting Study, done over 20 years and is still ongoing, um, where he, at the beginning of it, had around 300 people answer questions over 20 plus years, uh, all very uh, highly educated. Two of, uh, two thirds of them had PhDs, a lot of political scientists and uh, economists. And they answered questions like, will the Muslim Brotherhood win the elections in Egypt and by a certain date? And they always answered yes or no. So they would know exactly by a date if they were actually right or wrong. Okay, so with that sort of qualitative data, doing it for 20 years, they could get to a quantitative sort of proof for uh, if people are right or wrong. And then they try to measure and correlate that with uh, personality. And then they would find what correlated with making good decisions and then would teach it to people 
in a controlled A-B test, basically, and see if they could create a causal relationship between a certain way of thinking and making good decisions. So, uh, first of all, on average, they were worse than random guests, right? They were, he, he draws the parallel to if a chimpanzee would be f uh, throwing darts at a dartboard and that would be the answer, the patterns of it, um, that would be better than the average scientist or, or researcher partaking in this study. But he looked through the numbers, or they did, and they, they established this causal relationship between uh, personality and good judgment. Let me just tell you that it was not IQ, not at all. They found something else, and they found something that they divided into two groups, two different personalities. One they call the hedgehogs, and they are bad predictors. And they summarized it basically as dogmatism. So uh, key characteristics of these people were uh, highly opinionated, simple answers to difficult questions, confident inability to judge, looks for facts to prove themselves right, have one view of the world and then changes the rules of proof to fit their view. This is so frustrating when you're trying to talk to someone and you'd be like, no, I really got proof that you're wrong. You have to, to change your mind now. And then they always seem to like slip out of it somehow. And this is the reason IQ is not correlated with making better decisions. Because the higher IQ you have, the better you are at finding an excuse to like slip out of whatever proof showed up, and then you tend to miss the point. So, as Mark Twain said, it ain't uh, what you don't know that gets you into trouble, it's what you know for sure that just ain't so. So the good predictors, they call foxes, and good, uh, they are basically the opposite. So get carefully weighs proofs for and against, complex answers to difficult questions, confident in difficulty of judging, looks for facts to prove themselves wrong, and update their belief from presented with new evidence. Sounds like how we want to behave, but it's very, very, very difficult. And the thing is, we have this media landscape and this landscape in general where we think that interesting people are those with very strong opinions. And if we got a debate show, it would be terribly frustrating if everyone on there would just sit there and say, it depends. It won't give us anything. So good media and good TV and good entertainment is really assertive people with strong opinions, i.e. bad predictors. Um, so visualize, I think this is sort of a hedgehog. You start with one idea of the world, and over time, as new proof are really uh, revealed, you, you have the same position. Right? Nothing changes. Uh, this is uh, uh, foxes. They have one view, and then they uh, get um, evidence, and then they maybe hold, at one time, five different possible ways of interpreting a certain situations, situation, and they know they all can't be true, but they, they know that some of them are, and the probability of one being wrong uh, will differ depending on the proofs that are revealed over time. So and then sort of the thinking evolves and they may end up with the same position and the same sort of belief, but they had a vastly different process of getting there. This is what um, we're very, we were very focused on working with at Spotify and what we're extremely focused on right now in my team at working with at Minecraft. Try to get to that mindset. And I want to give you two very practical ways of doing so. One which is a process which you can involve others in, and one which is your own process as a designer or product team. So the first one is pre-mortem. You might have done a post-mortem, where you sit down after a project and you talk about uh, how it went and how you can improve. A pre-mortem is the opposite, as in you sit down during a project, thus pre, before it ends, and then you pretend that it was a complete disaster and you're two years into the future, and you're looking back, and you like you don't want to even go to work because it was such a disaster. Okay, so you're in the future, you're thinking about this product that failed, and then you have to, to come up with like, why did you fail? So the key idea here is that by asking this question in this way, in a room to a group of people, you create um, a climate where it's positive to be negative. And it's 
often extremely scary to be in a regular meeting, like, hey, I think we're going to fail. You're going to be like labeled the negative or difficult one. But if you have a context where the point of the exercise is to be negative and, and the more you're trying to talk about it, the more context you'll have so you can course correct, then it's much easier to sort of talk about failure. And there's actually some good studies about this working pretty well. There's a Freakonomics episode just about this process. If you're a podcast lover, please Google it. And we use this, and it is actually pretty fun. Um, and people are afraid of so many different things. It's always such an eye-opener for me to run this with a team. You can do it with your boss or anyone. Get a group of people, uh, give them tons of post-its, ask them, why did we fail? And you're in the future. The other one is a framework that I'm just going to touch very lightly upon, which we call design bets, where you're basically doing hypothesis-driven design, and you're treating every single project and suggestion as a gamble. So you say, we believe that betting X amount of money working on Y will produce outcome Z. And you present this set of ideas through something that we call an hypothesis deck, which is basically a, a Google slide deck. Um, and I, I believe there is no such thing as deciding what idea is best. That's often what we do, I think, or try to do when we go through a process. But the idea here is to document our beliefs because things will change over time. So we have to go back and look at things and look at why we believe a certain thing when we tried to or when we decided to pursue a project. So this is like a slide of our hypothesis deck, but generalized. This is how it would look like. We'll always have an image trying to illustrate uh, what we're suggesting. This could be um, an iPhone um, mock-up without a um, hamburger menu, with a hamburger menu. And we describe then what the, what the idea is. And then we spend a lot of time trying to talk about the failing parts and the risk with this idea. So I pulled out those, these three paragraphs here. This is a template. You say, we believe that by change, as in what you're trying to change, by introducing a hamburger menu, we will see changing behavior, as in we hope that people will explore the app more because we are revealing all the different tabs, all the different sections of our app if we use a tab bar. So that's the change of behavior, right? People will click on more things, which will lead to a measurable impact. Probably you want higher attention, or maybe um, wider sort of engagement, like in more parts of your app. And we believe this because we have observed data, or we believe it despite having observed data. Here's the, here's the cool part. You can include anything here. This is, this is not supposed to be extremely scientific. This is supposed to be valuable. And valuable here could be my um, stepdad did this and it worked for them. That's our data point. That's a valid data point. That's better than nothing. So please include any sort of data that you have. Of course, if it's, if it's um, qualitative, or quantitative, it's probably better. And if, if you have done a study, a qualitative study, you have a lot of valuable context. But don't be afraid of including data that is pretty weak, because it's better than no data. So if, if you saw like, Google do something similar, just say they did it. They probably measured, so that's your data point. Include any data that you have. Then we believe it could fail because of recent. This is also very important. You're trying to be your own devil's advocate. It can be sort of an exercise of trying to come up with a bad reason. Like, it, yeah, it's uh, maybe because it's just a trend. But. I think it's a good exercise, and it, and it moves you towards chasing sort of truth rather than just pushing your own idea, which is the general mindset that we're after. This also means that all ideas are welcome. We try to gather a lot of ideas in a slide deck. It could be 100 ideas just for um, exploring the sort of new, uh, maybe the Nux flow for, for an app. And everyone, anyone that has an idea can have a slide. So it's not trying to show off the best ideas, it's trying to gather all of the ideas. So we want to document our beliefs, state why uh, we believe ideas are bad and not just good. That's sort of the point of this document. 
And with that, hopefully, we're trying to chase this mindset. So we're trying to go from being pragmatic and just having one idea, make it flat, and introduce more white space and make the logo smaller, and have basically evolution uh, within uh, Google Slide Stock. So, to be the, uh, my own devil's advocate, is this undermining our credibility when we're presenting a slide deck like this? It might look like we have no idea what we're doing because we're pitching to, um, uh, to a client, like, here we got 10 ideas, they might all fail. That might look bad. I believe that if you do it in the right way, which is tricky, that is fine because you can be assertive yet nuanced, right? So I think an, a client wants you to have confidence, but you can have confidence in your process rather than all of your ideas. So I think you can, believe, you can be assertive yet nuanced, and then your, your client will actually really listen to you. Because you've arrived at something by trying a range of options, and they can see them all documented, and the reasons for your beliefs, rather than just like the end of that journey, the ta-da moment when something pops up from a package that they bought. So I think avoiding failure by focusing only on success is the act of trying to solve a problem by applying ignorance. This is often what we're doing in design when we're pitching things. So we should treat every project like a gamble and talk about risk. That's it. Thank you.